Amen. If you're taking notes, the title of this message is called Speak Life. I want to just ask you a very simple question. Think about this. It's a rhetorical question, but let's take inventory right now. If you were to take inventory of all of the words that you spoke this past month, are you building up the world around you or are you burning it down? I, for the longest time, hated checking my bank account. Can anybody agree? Anybody? There's got to be at least like more than two people. Okay, a lot of you. So that's a problem. Because you know what that's an indicator of? Like, we don't want to see what's going on there. We don't want the reality of what's going on in our bank account or mint.com or whatever financial thing we're using to track our budget. We don't want that to show us. Uh, we just, we hate seeing the red numbers, right? Can I get an amen from somebody? We hate seeing, if you have like the income chart and you have the expenses chart, the green mountain is way smaller than the red mountain, right? And for so long, before my, my, uh, our money was pretty funny as a family and I, uh, I hated opening that thing up because it was like, it was a constant reminder of how, of how I uh, had to grow or where God was sharpening us in our stewardship. And I was thinking, how wild would it be if there was an app that did a similar thing, but instead of measuring your income and your expenses, it measured your words? Where month to month, like the positive words, the life-giving words that you speak, that adds, boop, 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 that adds to your green mountain. But the negative words that we speak, that's the deficit. That shows, that shows how much we're negatively affecting the world around us. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you right now. If you were to have that app, if that app were to be opened up on your phone right now, just from this past month, there's no shame or judgment, but we will be directed and we will be corrected by the Holy Spirit because he wants to lead us into life, right? He wants, us to, he wants to lead us into abundant life. From this past month alone, where would you be? Would you be in the negative or would there be in the, such an abundance of goodness and good fruit in your life that everybody else around you could get a piece of it? I want to read for you guys Ezekiel chapter 37 from beginning to end. I'm just going to read, well, not really beginning to end, through verse 14, but there's just something about this story that I feel like if we just read it, it's going to, it preaches itself to us in a really beautiful way. Ezekiel 37, verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. And he, God, said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. We'll get to that in a minute. It's a pretty funny response. Verse 4, and he again, again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. So I prophesied. Let's go Ezekiel. Zeke. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. Hallelujah. And the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Yeah, come on now. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. 
They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, all, all my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put, this is my favorite part, man, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Amen. Amen to the reading of the word of God. I want to give you a little bit of context about what's happening here, because some of you are like, what the heck are we talking about here? Ezekiel is a prophet. And what's a prophet? A prophet is, a, to describe it as simply as this, a prophet was somebody and is somebody to this day. Prophets still exist today. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. But the prophet is a man, typically a man, appointed by God to hear the voice of God on behalf of other people and to declare that word basically as a mouthpiece of God for other people. Ezekiel is a prophet for his people, the Israelites, who have just been taken exiled to Babylon because of their disobedience and their rebellion against God. God is all loving and all merciful, but at some point his wick of patience runs through. And what he has to do is he has to bring divine correction and discipline to his people. He allows his people to be taken to captivity in Babylon. And in this moment of exile, of being in captivity, God uses Ezekiel, who is one of the captives, to speak this word of hope. That although they see all of their heritage gone, they see their defense system gone, they see all hope gone, God says through Ezekiel, he says, can this impossible situation be turned around? And what does Ezekiel say? You know. And what God does is he gives, he gives Ezekiel these words to prophesy to these bones as a picture of how he will restore the entire nation again. And so when we look at this contextually, it's an amazing story. As, what's crazy is, think about what's even happened with Israel. A little side note. Israel was a country that completely disappeared off the face of the planet. And then in 1948, was reestablished as a nation again. It was the only country in the history of the world that disappeared and then came back. This is the prophetic word being fulfilled for the people of Israel. That God would reestablish his people again. That God has, a, has an unconditional covenant with his people that he will protect them and he will prosper them. That's what we're seeing contextually here, which is already a message that is so worth preaching. But as we look into this, and I'm praying, God, what, what might you want to give us practically from this message today? The Lord re reminded me of this verse. I want you to, the verse is probably going to be on the screen, but it's Proverbs 18, verse 21. Check this out. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Come on, somebody. Death, I'm going to read it again. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. As I was praying, I was asking God, okay, how, why is this message so important to you, God? And the reason why the Lord put on my heart that this was such an important message to give is because the Lord revealed to me that so often, because of certain circumstances that we're going through, dry bone seasons, we begin to put curses on God and what he's done in our lives without realizing that we are actually part of the problem because of the words that we're speaking about the season that we're in. The question that I want to ask you today is, if you could measure the fruit, that, like, if you could literally see the fruit, the apples, the oranges, the bananas, coming out of your mouth, coming out of my mouth, when we speak over our season, when we speak over our marriages, when we speak over our children, when we speak over the community that God has put us in, if we could see it, 
Would we be appetized by it or would we be disgusted by it? Guys, this is a double-edged sword because I know you're thinking like, oh my gosh, he's coming, he's coming at me hard today. But here's what I want to tell you. Though the problem, the problem, the true problem is that we are so flippant with our words, James talks about this, this little muscle, this thing called the tongue. This thing is tiny. This thing is like this big. Or maybe actually if you use an x-ray, it'd be like that big. Regardless, it's not that big, right? It's not that big of a muscle. But in James, it talks about this thing can control the direction that you and I go in. Meaning that, and I'm not saying that, by the way, that everything that happens in our lives is because it's our fault. We can be, we can be a victim of what the enemy might be doing to us. We might be a victim of what's been handed down to us. But we can take responsibility of what we do with the hand that we've been dealt. And let me tell you, a lot of the times what we're experiencing in our lives, we are self-sabotaging ourselves because we have not guarded this thing. We have spoken out of our opinions. We've spoken out of our frustrations. We've spoken out of agreement to what the world is saying or even people around us who, who don't have the faith that God has called them to have. Instead of partnering with the word of God and saying, God, I want, I, if it's, if it's going to come through this mouth, it better have come through your mouth first. Because when we allow God to speak through us, everything changes. Everything can really change. I want to share with you a couple other verses that are super powerful. I'll just give you one. Matthew 12, verses 35 through 37. This is Jesus. Anyone like Jesus? I love Jesus. And when he speaks and you see the red letters, like, we got to pay attention to that. Like, this is important stuff. Matthew 12, 35 through 37 says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word, for every bad word, for every idle word, every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. What is an idle word? An idle word is a dead word. It's a lifeless word. It's a worthless word. Okay? I'm, I'm particularly not excited for that conversation with Jesus. Because <laughs> your, boy, your boy knows. He said some idle things. Okay? And there's grace. I mean, this isn't a salvation issue. We're not saved by what we say or don't say. We're saved by what he did for us on the cross, dying for our sins, paying for our penalty in full, rising from the dead, and then says merely by faith in his finished work, we get to experience eternal life. That's it. This is, this is a different type of, this is the conversation after that, where it's like, okay, now you're in, you're in, you made it into heaven, you're in the family of God. But it, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you were technically supposed to die, and I was supposed to live through you. But this, what you said, doesn't sound like me. It sounds like you. Jesus is telling us this because he understands. He wants us to understand that what we say can burn down. A lot of you know that personally because of something that was said to you by your parent when you were a kid, and it, it has shaped you ever since, and it has derailed you ever since, and in the back of your head, you can't accomplish enough in life. You can't marry a hot enough wife. You can't have a big enough house. You cannot do enough good without that word of death echoing in the back of your head. You know personally how a word can bring death as well as how it can change everything. When a word is given in season, when you thought all hope was lost, when you didn't, you didn't see any, anything redeemable in you and in your situation, all it took was for one person to say, hey, I just felt like God just put this on my heart to tell you this. I see this in you. I see that you're an overcomer. I see that he's working in your life. I just want to encourage you that when you said this the other day, you might have felt really stupid. You looked, like, you looked like you were ashamed of what you said, but when you said it, it changed my life. And I want you to know that you speak as the oracle of God, and I'm really proud to be your friend. What happens in someone's life when we partner with his script and we say what he's saying. The first question I want to ask you right now, practically, is what valley has God placed you in? 
What's amazing about this is we see in Ezekiel chapter 37. I want you to write this down, guys. Take notes. This is a, these are really important questions for us to be asking ourselves. Because it says here in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 2, it says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were many in the open valley. Indeed, they were very dry. You know what's amazing about that? It doesn't say, Ezekiel doesn't say, God abandoned me, and I found myself in a valley of dry bones. It says that God picked me up, and he set me in the valley of dry bones. But when we're going through a valley of dry bones... When you and I are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, isn't it tempting to believe that the only reason why we're there is because God left us? I've been there. I've asked God, why would you leave me? Like, you, it really, your word says you didn't, but it really feel like, feels like you did. Can I, can I get an amen from somebody in here? Okay, let's take the religious face off today because this is real. This is, this is what we all go through. But this is what's so encouraging to me. Ezekiel wasn't abandoned there. He was placed there. He was placed there for what purpose? So that the purpose of God, the power of God, could be worked through him if he was willing to partner with God and not get frustrated at God with what he was seeing. What valley of dry bones has God placed you in? Maybe it's a health report. I personally know stories of people in this house who have been trying to get pregnant for months and years. Talk about a valley of dry bones. I personally have friends who are going through some of the greatest financial difficulty that they've ever walked through. And their life is in order. They're loving God. They're serving God. They're taking care of their families faithfully. It's like, and then you're in this place where you're like, God, what gives? What more can I do for you? Have you abandoned me? Could it be that God has placed you so that you can be a part of resurrecting the world around you? Where has God placed you? Now, you might be thinking, okay, Cap, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about wishful thinking? Are we talking about denying reality? Are we talking about just closing your eyes? And, and if the doctor gave me the diagnosis saying, no, I'm, the, I'm, not, I'm not sick. I didn't get that diagnosis. No, I'm not saying that we live in a false reality here. That's not faith. Faith isn't denying what you see. That's not faith. Faith is not denying what you see. It's calling forth what you can't see. I'll prove it to you. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what I'm talking about, what we're talking about today, when we're, ta when we're talking about speaking life, we're talking about speaking life over your work, speaking life over your family, speaking life over that relationship, relationship where you're like, man, this person, I don't know how much I have to serve them and take care of them. They never respond to me. This relationship feels like a curse more than it feels like a blessing. Speaking life is going in the opposite spirit. And it's not ignoring the dry bones. It's saying, I recognize the dry bones. Even look, look what Ezekiel says right here. It says that when he was placed there, God caused him to pass by them all around. God was showing him, saying, I want you to see this. I want you to face this thing. I don't want you to hide away from this thing because if you don't face this thing, that's not what faith really looks like. Faith looks like looking death straight in the eyes and speaking life over it anyway. It's not ignoring what's in front of you. When Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the grave, he didn't deny that Lazarus had died. Do you remember what it says? Shortest verse in the Bible, two words. Jesus wept. Jesus faced the emotion of what he was looking at face to face. And that is where the genuineness of our faith is revealed. When we can look at what's right in front of us and say, you know what? I see it. I'm not going to deny it. But at the same time, I'm not living by this. I'm living by what I hear here. Because the word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I'm not going to let what I see dictate my reality. Am I preaching to somebody right now? I'm going to let this word, I'm going to let this word tell me what God is able to do. But let's be real. What valley has God placed you in? For some of you, it might be chemistry class. I hate chemistry class. Here's what's amazing. You might be thinking, well, my valley is not that, is not that as bad as somebody else's valley, so who am I to complain? Guys, 
God, God, he's given us all prescriptions based off of our own growth pattern of where he's taken each of us. Don't deny where he's placed you and the difficulty that you're going through now. Let me tell you, the greatest test that you're going to go through is still ahead of you. But honor the test that he's given you right now so that you might pass the test. Dominate. Amen. Second question. Do you believe he has the power to change it? Man, you guys are quiet. Some of you don't believe. And that's okay. I don't blame you. But look at what happens here. Look at what Ezekiel, uh, God says in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 3. It says, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Man, sometimes like God asking you a question is like the worst thing because you're like, oh, shoot, <laughs> like I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to give the wrong answer here. But you know what I love? Like, because what happens? God just took Ezekiel on this little tour. Like he toured him around all these dry bones. And what does it say? It said that the bones were very many and the bones were very dry, which means these things weren't dead. They were dead, dead. They were like super dead. Like <laughs> these things, there ain't no way these things are coming back. Like this is like, this is a situation that is so beyond repair. I hope this is preaching that this situation is so beyond what I could imagine putting back together in my own strength. And God says, can these bones live again? <laughs> you know, that's what Ezekiel says, you know. I love that response. I love that response. You know, God, I, I've never seen anything like this. We're in our family. We're going through a diagnosis right now that on paper, it's like we've never seen this thing reversed. I don't know. Google sure don't know. Like, don't know. I don't know who knows. WebMD, don't ever look at WebMD if you want to have peace of mind. WebMD don't know. WebMD is saying, you dead, dead. <laughs> like, you reading this and you dead. It says, what? I don't know. But you know? You know? He knows. He knows what can be done. He knows how to do it. And all he, dude, this is what's amazing about God. He will just give you the words to say. But what we need to do is we need to turn from our unbelief, believing in ourselves, believing in WebMD, believing in Google, believing in what our friends say or what we said or what we saw or didn't see with the other person that we prayed for and it didn't work out then, so why would it possibly work now? Am I preaching? You know. Do you have belief? Do you believe that God is powerful enough to actually change it? Watch this. Hebrews 11:6 it says but without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him James 1, 6 through 8. Man, this Joy and I were just talking about this last night. This verse, like, when you read these verses, you're like, is that really there? Like, because that challenges a lot of things that I believe, but it's there. It's in the text. It's like staring me right in the face. James 1, 6 through 8 says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. If you ever pray a prayer that says, God, I don't really believe God's able to do this, but I'm just going to throw up some static anyway, whether we say it or that's what the condition in our heart, why would, we're just wasting breath. Why, why even waste breath if we have not put ourselves in this position of, God, you know, I'm putting my faith in you. Because it says right here that if we ask with unbelief, we shouldn't expect to receive anything. But then this is what Jesus says in Mark 11, 20 through 24. I'm giving you a lot of scripture. Are you guys holding on? You guys, you got like buckle your seatbelts, okay? Mark 11, 20 through 24 says, now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter remembering said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever, what, what, look what he says, whoever says to this mountain, I'm, there's a time to pray, there's a time to ask God to do something, 
But what Jesus is saying right here is whoever says, speaks to this mountain, when he died and he gave us his life and he put his Holy Spirit in us and he gives us his name to speak in the name of Jesus, we get an authority to speak as if Jesus is speaking through us. There is a time to pray. It's biblical. We see it all over. We see it in James. We see it praying for healing. But then there's a time to just speak, to just take the authority that God has given us and said, no, as an ambassador of the kingdom of God, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, mountain, move. So what it says, it says, speak to the mountain. Whoever says to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that these things he says will be done. Guess what? He has whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Here's two, two quick action points for you, okay? It's a super simple process. If you're about to go to God and ask for something, if you're gonna speak something over your situation that is such an offense to what you've seen with your eyes and what you know to be possible, all you gotta do is confess your unbelief. That's it. That's it. Father, I come before you right now and I recognize that you are God and that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. But I gotta be honest, my eyes, what I see, this thing, it's really speaking loudly to me right now. And I'm gonna confess that to you. I wanna confess my unbelief to you. You aren't the problem, God, I'm the problem. Some of us really need to get that in our vocabulary. God, you're not the problem. You've never been the problem. You've always been good. You were good, will be good, and you're good in this situation. Forgive me, cleanse me, and God, fill me with faith. Speak through me right now. God will answer that prayer. God will honor that prayer. 1 John 1, 9 says that if any of us trespass in unbelief, guys, we can take a lot of pride in our unbelief. I'm just a cynical person. I'm just a doubtful person. That's a sin. Unbelief is a sin. We need to take that sin, we need to crucify it, we need to say, Father, forgive me for this. First John 1, 9 says that when we do, what does he do? He's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to forgive us of our sin. It's beautiful, but we gotta partner with these words. We need to speak these words. Three, third question. Are you prepared to preach the precise word needed? over your situation, over the loved one, over the people at your workplace who hate God? Are you, am I prepared to preach the precise word? Because you know what I love about Ezekiel? I'm going to try to just summarize this. God gives him the script. Ezekiel's not just prophesying out of his own imagination. He's not just saying what he thinks or what he wants. No, God is literally giving him the words to say. And he's giving him the words to say for different things. He's giving him the words to say to the bones so that the bones rattle and come together. He's giving him the words to say for the sinews and the muscles and the flesh so the flesh comes over the bones. He's giving him the words to say for the breath, the breath that enters those skeletons. He's giving him the words to say for the spirit of God that comes inside of these people. Every part of this process, he gives him the direction to say. One of my favorite scriptures, check this out, Isaiah chapter 50, verse four. It says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word, a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. What does this look like? One thing that I think is super powerful about my own devotional time with the Lord, I think about us being like little doctors, right? If he's the great physician and he lives inside of us, then we're like little great physicians, right? Not the great physician, don't, don't mishear what I'm saying, but he's given us an authority and a power to go and deliver words to people over situations that set captives free, that heal the sick, that cast out demons, that raise the dead, that bring hope to hopeless situations, that restore relationships. He is giving us, and when I look at this, I'm like, this, I want, Lord, I want to dive into this. I want to correctly divide this. I want to hide. I'm, I'm taking that verse right now. That's a great word, verse about finances. I'm going to put that in my heart. And when someone's going through a financial situation, that thing is locked and loaded, ready to deliver to somebody who needs hope in that season. 
If I need some scripture about healing and what is God's will about healing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill my heart. I'm gonna be prepared. I will be prepared to preach the word of God in season and out of season. Because this isn't just about me. This isn't just about me having a good day, having my ducks in a row. Christianity is not just about me, man. My, deep, my devotional time with the Lord is not just about me surviving through life. And I get it. If you're going through a season where you feel like that, that's appropriate from time to time. But that should not be the dominant narrative of the Christian. The dominant narrative of the Christian is I am more than an overcomer through Jesus who loves me. This isn't my home. I'm a sojourner. I'm a pilgrim. I'm just passing through anyway. I'm on a mission here to see those, to seek and save those who are lost on behalf of my king. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be prepared to deliver the living word of God to those who need it. Are you prepared to, pre to preach the precise word of God wherever he's placed you? I'm going to invite the worship team up as we close. Here's the final, the final point I want to share. Because some of you are thinking, okay, Cap, I've been walking with the Lord for a while. I've been trying to exercise this for a while. I've been, I've been speaking life over my hopeless situation for years now. And honestly, I hear what you're saying and I receive it. But if I'm, if I'm completely, if I want to be real with you, I'm weary. How many times do I have to tell that mountain to move before I just say, nah, I look, I'm just looking like a fool telling this mountain to move in my life and it's not moving and I've been doing it for years and everyone thinks I'm crazy. When do I just give up? What's amazing about this, this passage is, remember what God asked Ezekiel? He said, are these bones able to come back to life? Ezekiel says, you know. If God is the one doing it, if God is able to do it, why doesn't he do it the first shot? Why doesn't he just speak the word and then all of a sudden the bones come together, the flesh comes on, the breath enters in, the spirit falls upon? Why doesn't it happen in one shot? I'm so encouraged that it doesn't. Because what this tells me is that God is patient and God works through a process. Prophetic declaration over a situation, over a loved one, over yourself. Sometimes it can be a one and done thing. But oftentimes it's a process. And sometimes we got we to gotta look for the smallest win possible. You're praying and you're, you're, you're declaring God's word over a prodigal child. I haven't talked to them in a long time. And you're like, man, I just want to have what we used to have. I want, I want that relationship restored. I just want it. I, I miss my little girl. I miss my son. I just, I want, I want to have what we used to have. And then you get a text message from them. And they say, dad, can you send me a couple hundred bucks? The, the, the temptation is to be like, this thing is cursed. This relationship is cursed. When you weren't even receiving a text message like that for years, and then it comes in. Instead of despising the days of small beginnings, thank God for it. Water that seed. God, I thank you that they're coming to me asking for, as an ATM machine. I think, and I'm, I'm giving you a simple example here, but I want you to put, put it into your own context right now. What does it look like? Because if we are really paying attention to these dry bones and we're really facing it head on and we're really being diligent and proclaiming and prophesying the word of God over our situation, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss the rattling. If you're not paying attention, you'll miss the rattling and then you'll run away from God because he didn't do it fast enough. I've been there. I've been, I'm there right now in some situations in my life and I've had to repent. I've had to take things that I've said that came out of my mouth and I had to practically say, God, I cancel those. I cancel all of those curses that I spoke. Forgive me, forgive me. And he's able, he's able. It's not too late. 
It's not too late if you've been talking about your, your spouse and man, I just, I wish that they would. I wish that da, 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 da. It's not too late. I'm not saying don't be real before God, but what I'm saying is speak life. Let life be the last word. God, I'm struggling, da, 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 but I will still hold on to your promises. Though these dry bones are many dry bones and they very dry bones. You know, you know. I wanna invite you to stand to your feet right now as we close. I want you to think about that situation in your life. I want you to think about that relationship. I want you to think about, for some of you, it's your relationship with God. You have spoken death over your relationship with God. God doesn't speak to me. God doesn't know me. God doesn't care. If he cared, he would have done this. Blah, 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 blah. And let me tell you, this, you're, you're, I'm gonna say this as lovingly as possible. God's not the problem. He never was. He never will be. And until we can take ownership of how this thing is creating some serious red mountains in my life and I need to start creating some green mountains in my life, this thing is creating all sorts of crazy fruit that is just bitter. I wouldn't expect anything to change. Not because I said so, but because the word of God says so. But if we believe, if we believe that he is able, if we're looking at this thing locked eye with the situation and we believe that he is able and we've prepared in our hearts the prescriptions of the words that need to be said and we say them diligently, here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor will never be in vain in the Lord. You always get a positive ROI. So I want you to put your hand over your heart right now. I just want to pray for you. I want to speak life over you. But I want you to speak life over yourself right now too. Whatever it is, whether it's a, a diagnosis or a thought pattern or you've been really, you're struggling to figure out if you're going to pay rent. I don't know what it is, but I want you to receive this right now. I want you to, right before God, I want you to confess your unbelief. I want you to just... All of us right now, Lord, we repent of our unbelief. We ask you that you would forgive us for identifying with unbelief. That was never a portion that you gave us. Father, we ask that you would give us faith right now because the faith-filled one lives in us as believers. He's got the faith. I don't know, but you know, and you live in me. So Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you'd give me the words to say, words of life that no weapon formed against me will prosper, that my spouse is not a curse, it's a blessing. He or she is a blessing from the Lord. And it is not better that I am alone, but that I am with them. I thank you, God, that my children are not a curse, but they are an inheritance from the Lord. And they're not even mine, they belong to you. God, I thank you that my job is not my own, my finances are not my own, they are all yours. And I am just your steward, forgive me for speaking like the owner that I never was. I'm just here to steward what you've entrusted to me. Father, for the people in my life, extended family members, people at work who don't know you, who hate you, that I've said they'll never get right, they'll never come to know God, they'll never come out of their destructive habits. Father, I cancel those words right now in the name of Jesus, and I declare your life over them. If you could do it in me, you can do it in them. You are the resurrection. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. You are the living God, and you are not done. We declare this today. We declare this today. We partner with you in agreement in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.